Donald James Lamb was with the 1st Squadron, 1st Armored Cav, B Troop, Hill 29. Our headquarters are in July. We are part of the AmeriCal Division. Before going to Vietnam, I was with the 1st of the 54th Infantry Recon Platoon in Bamberg, Germany. And then I came down on the levee to go to Vietnam. I originally was with MACV, and then uh, in November 67, transferred out of MACV to the uh, B Troop, 1st Cav. Uh, they were at LZ Ross uh, at the time, uh, and that was part of the AmeriCal Division. LZ Ross, and they were, uh, <laughs> they went out there in October just to uh, escort artillery pieces. They had some 155s, 175s, and 8 inchers, and they were only supposed to stay a week or two. That was in October. I entered the unit December 28th in 67 is when I joined them, and uh, we didn't leave until around the 11th or 12th after losing about 80% of our equipment and 75% of the men in operations in and around the LZ. Uh, Tet uh, was uh, started in the end of January, Febu early February, and was involved very much throughout the entire Tet Offensive. Uh, was involved with uh, uh, helping with the retake of Way and uh, other uh, operations all along, uh, all along the coast, from uh, Cigar Island on up to Way. The recent time of an infantry soldier in World War II in actual combat was 10 days a year. In Vietnam, we were exposed or involved in combat 244 days a year. I discussed that with a man who was at Omaha Beach. We were trading stories and he was in a horrific situation. And then when I told him what we did, I said every night it was like the old fashioned cavalry. We were in Indian territory we circled the wagons and tried to survive every night. It was like that. Even when we were back at the base camp, which was Hill 29, we were on perimeter guard and took uh, harassment fire. It was constant. It was all the time. I was a cavalry scout. When I first arrived at Hill 29, I mean, I'm sorry, at LZ Ross, I met uh, Captain Baravetta, and that was, like I said, uh, December 20, 67. Uh, and he, and I told him I just came up and hadn't been with a TAC unit because I had been working with MACV. So he said, well, he put me on a, on a vehicle and we were armored cavalry. It was the old horse cavalry of the original and they gave us vehicles. Uh, a new cavalry platoon had three tanks. We had a mortar vehicle. We had our own infantry squad and all the rest were scouts. And originally, we were the eyes and ears of the 1st Armored Division, 1st Squadron, 1st Regiment. And that's why you don't see uh, like the, uh, the air cab has the big yellow Ours was uh, the Black Hawk Division, if you get into it, because we weren't a division, we were a regiment assigned to a division. It was different, but we are the most decorated unit in all the armed forces. At last count that I saw, we had a reunion at Fort Bliss. That's where our unit is now stationed. When they brought our colors out, it took two people because we had like 100 and 
15 or more battle streamers, which is more than twice as many as any other unit in any of the military. Right there on the 28th of December, on the 3rd of January, we were overrun uh, at LZ Ross. We could see the start at uh, another LZ. I can't remember the name of the first one. The second was LZ Leslie, which uh, I later just recently found out that one of my good friends and fishing partners, he was in the uh, uh, artillery unit 105s with the air cap. He just died last winter and I wore my uniform or my uh, uh, Stetson, my calf stuff and was a pallbearer. Uh, and I found out from his best friend that he entered. It's just a, such a long story. But anyway, I found out he was in at Leslie at the time and we never even talked about it because it's something you just don't, you know, you respect and you don't do a lot of talking about. It started at uh, LZ in a long time and then at Leslie and then it hit us. And I mean, when they hit us, it was terrible. And I was still just with uh, another unit because uh, he put me on a track with a, uh, uh, with a Spec 5 track commander who was, uh, and we were just trying to survive. It was the first uh, air cab was uh, dug in in between our vehicles. We were just firing like, and finally the artillery told us to get our heads down, everybody, and they loaded a uh, flechette or like eight inches with the flechette rounds, lowered it ground level and uh, just let it rip. They ran right through us. They never stopped. The next morning, just in our, in the Constantina wire in front of the platoon I was with, there was 129 bodies. Uh, it was a horrible, horrible night. Uh, you, you, that's all I can say. Uh, a few days later, we got, on the 7th, we got involved with another mess because the, uh, the air cab was on patrol and started taking some sporadic fire and was pinned down and asked us to come and help while they were trying to draw us in together. And when we got down with them, uh, all hell kind of broke loose. And uh, uh, when we returned fire, their captain screamed at us. We were hitting them. The NVA had got in between us and uh, was causing us uh, a mess you know, to shoot at each other. Captain Bervetta thought we were shooting our own people. He jumped off to go give help. And the uh, people said that he was hit over a hundred times immediately. And we lost our captain who was, the people, it was like, he was amazing. He was the best NC, uh, best command, uh, company, true commander you could ever want. Everybody respected, loved him. He was a great man. There's a building of Fort Knox named after him. Uh, a training building and uh, things kind of deteriorated. It took four days and we were a half a mile from Hill, from uh, LZ Ross. It took four days to recover. We lost 80% of our equipment, 75% of the men were wounded or I think there was 20, 22 or 27 died or I'm not sure. It was not good. But uh, that was the first uh, first major, major uh, that I got into. I was not hit during either one of those. How? I have no idea. There was only a handful of us, and I was a new NCO with the unit. But I got back. When we got back, we got a new troop commander. He lives not far from here in Brooklyn, Michigan. 
and I ran into him when I was take, getting my college degree at Eastern Michigan. He was teaching uh, our OTC there, and we just ran into each other. So I was reunited, and he got me into going to reunions. But I was wounded in February. I was actually my first wound came when I was with uh, Mac V, but I can't talk much about it. It was a booby trap that I uh, was hit, and that was uh, that was our first wound. My second wound was came in February at Mil Milai at Pinkville. We call it Pinkville. I was shot, and I so was my right gunner. We were both hit in the firefight in the middle of the night. And then the third time I was wounded was that uh, we got involved in a double ambush. And uh, I was riding along with uh, the second pl platoon's, uh, Lieutenant Stevenson's track. My best friend was his track commander and was the uh, scout section leader. He was, that was part of his job as well as being the track commander of the, of the uh, platoon leader's track. And he just arrived from back from Hawaii where he, on R&R, &R, we learned his wife was pregnant. And we were best friends. I was a replacement. He came over originally from Fort Hood with the unit back in August of 67. And he wanted me to take his job so he could get out of the field. So that was the only reason I wasn't on my regular track that day. I was riding with them and another troop, I can't remember if it was A or C, got involved with an ambush and we went over to help them and got on a, a assault line or a skirmish line, went through and assaulted the ambush and these, the, the Vietnamese were very good soldiers. They were, they were really good and it was their land. We got funneled into a single file again and got involved in a second ambush. And we set it off because my track, being an officer's track, was uh, hit with a, with a mine and uh, uh, the track was destroyed. The mine went off under the driver. I was thrown about 60 foot through the air and landed on my head where I, uh, I was a mess. I, I had poor Augie, the driver, all over me. I was covered with shrapnel. Uh, later I found out my eardrums were ruptured, perforated, my uh, head was gashed open, and uh, later I found out my shoulder had been broken and uh, dislocated and reset itself. So that was the third wound I got. Uh, and I was put on light duty. I'll be honest with you. I hit the ground rolling and the lieutenant was screaming. I was so worried about Rich. Sergeant Richard Renfro was my best friend. I ran over to yell for a medic for Lieutenant Stevenson. I ran immediately over trying to find Rich. He rode the cupola out and uh, instead of dropping out of it, it flew off the vehicle. And uh, when I ran over the 50, it swung over and crushed his head and killed him. And I immediately threw up and started crying. That's it. Well, I, <clears throat> I was put on like three weeks late duty for the wounds. I was sent back to the unit and I was, uh, after a week of light duty, our light duty consisted of building bunker. We were building a bunker for the, uh, for the unit there. And, uh, uh, and one of the other platoons got caught out and was in uh, trouble. So they asked for volunteers to go get them out and I raised my hand. And when we, finished getting them out 
and got back, my light duty evaporated, and I was back on duty. Uh, yeah, and so it, it is what it is. I mean, uh, you got to remember, I was 22. I was the old guy, and I was 22 years old. And I had a good group under me, uh, and uh, they wanted me back. So I went back to work, and uh, and uh, I stayed with the unit. We went through several different uh, situations, and uh, all along uh, we we uh, helped out recovering from the Tet Offensive in February, March, and then we had other operations. It was April 13, 68 when I hit, when we hit the mine. That was another uh, battle we were involved in. Uh, Tam Key, we were involved with. Cigar Island was horrible. We were there several times. It was a bad place. Now it's like uh, Laughlin, Nevada or Biloxi, Mississippi. It's all uh, casinos and hotels, it's a beautiful. It was a beautiful place back then. The sand was white as snow. With the, when the sun was fully out, it was it was behind you, but it was terrible. Uh, we could not stop for any longer than an hour and a half, two hours. They would set up their mortars, rockets, machine guns, and we would get hit. So we were continually on the move. But eventually, we'd just come off and it was in July. We just come off Cigar Island, and uh, it'd been out there for six days. We were involved in ten firefights or ambushes in ten days. We got back to uh, base camp Hill Twenty Nine, and got our mail. And I got a letter from home, and I didn't like it. It just uh, didn't make sense. And I took it up to Captain Reed, and I said. There's something going on at home. He read the letter and he says, I don't see anything here. I said, I'm telling you. He said, go see Ray, go see Marv at the Radio Shack. Have him get a helicopter. Go back to July to the Red Cross or yes, call home. You'll feel better. I was sitting in the Radio Shack and he got a call. And he said, you're not going to believe this, Lamb, but this is about you. He said, I got to go give it to the captain, follow me. And it was a notification from the Red Cross that I had to go home on emergency leave because my wife uh, was having emergency surgery and was going to have her leg amputated. I didn't know anything about this. So that's how I ended up going home. Uh, and uh, finding out uh, that she had cancer. And they later told us uh, when they did a uh, exploratory that it had already metastasized. So taking her leg wouldn't help her. It had spread to her liver and lungs. She was 21. As terrible as stuff was, and it was, you had to have some light. You had to have things going on. So there was constant uh, things to, to keep things uh, in a light uh, situation. We'd just come back from a horrible situation. I can't remember the exact, but it was, every time we got back to Hill 29, it, after a week or two or three, uh, the first thing you wanted to do was take a shower. And uh, so I went over and I filled the bucket up and, uh, with the submerged heater that you had to heat your own water, then transfer it up and throw it in a 55-gallon drum on top of the shower and uh, get in it. To, it was a job to get this done. But the hot shower felt so good when you got in. Well, the, uh, <laughs> the motor pool 
you guys, they had a pet monkey, George, and the bastards. Uh, I finally got in, and I'm taking my shower, and I was so excited about it. They threw the damn monkey in the shower with me, and I'm telling you, <laughs> after wrestling around with that and getting them out, uh, you had to laugh at the end, but by God, it was terrible. It had to be funny at the time. Uh, it was a good joke. Yeah, he, he couldn't hold that. One of the other ones was, it was a horror. I just told this to some of the guys out in the museum. It was a horrible day. I ended up doing a lot of, because the Lieutenant Stevenson, whose track I was on when I got wounded so bad, his radios went out. And one of our vehicles, our, our uh, infantry track, was hit with a recoilless rifle and burned. And uh, I had the medic with me. We went up and uh, got in front and uh, was providing security while the medic went over and got him off. And I had extra radios because I kind of was like a scrounge of the unit. If they couldn't find something, I figured out how to get it. Uh, we did a lot with the CBs down in Tam Key uh, trading. But anyway, uh, I ended up. Uh, taking over and calling in a medevac and transfer and relating line numbers so they could identify the people wounded, all that stuff. Well, when it was all said and done, we had to uh, uh, we had to assault that wood line where the fire came from. And uh, when we did, uh, it was just a bad day at Black Rock. When it was all said and done, it was late at night. The captain came back and joined the unit. He was on another. He took part of the troop and went over and joined another cab unit uh, in this whole operation. Well, it's. I think it was 3, 4 in the morning when we're finally headed out and trying to get back to Hill 29. And we were using white phosphorus from the artillery, the air uh, burst to navigate on, because you can't. And I'm going to tell you, if you want to see what Vietnam is like, go in a closet, shut the door, and have all the lights out. That's what it was like. Uh, if you're fortunate that it wasn't cloudy, you might see some stars, but it was flat and dark. Well, we're headed back, and uh, they had an air burst. And when they did, I saw that the cover was up on my 50 caliber machine gun. I'm up in the track commander. I'm in the cupola. <clears throat> and the air burst only lasted a few seconds. And I called the captain up. I said, you're going to have to have another flare or something. There's something wrong with my machine gun. I don't want it. Up, I said, I and when he did, I reached to close the cover, and the cover lurched at me. It wasn't the cover. I had a 18, a foot and a half long, six, eight inch wide centipede sitting on top of my machine gun, and it lurched at me. I backed up against the back of the cupola and yelled at my driver, Dale. Uh, it uh, helped me, and he put the asbestos mitten on uh, that we used to take the hot barrels off the machine guns. And when he reached up, uh, the, the captain just kept popping flares for us so we could see what the hell we were doing. And he reached up, and it ran up his arm, and he flew. We didn't know where the thing went. So uh, all the way back. And guys were goosing each other like we were getting bit by this damn uh, centipede. We never knew where whatever happened to it, but. Uh... They gave me uh, headquarters platoon sergeant on um, when we were in the field. I had two tracks. I had uh, uh, Bravo 9 and Bravo 4. Bravo 4 was actually the first sergeant, sorry, uh, first sergeant top, 
uh, Jim Johnson was a great guy. He recently just passed away, and he was just an amazing man. Uh, World War II, Korean, and Vietnam vet. He was just, but anyway, he was, his vehicle was Bravo 4. But when he went in the field, he always rode with me. He'd come over on my track. And uh, so they gave me this crew. I had two drivers. Uh, I, I was a track commander. I had another kid as a track commander and two gunners. But when we were in the field, we also had the medics. We took mechanics. We had a forward observer from the artillery. We had an interpreter. We, we had all these support people and we took them on our vehicles. So we always had uh, our own, uh, as I described the unit before, we had our own tanks, we had our own mortars, we had everything. We were self-contained completely. So uh, we had everything with us when we went out. Well, I told my crew, I said, look, I, I became a sergeant in less than 13 months. I joined, I was supposed to go to OCS, but I had a chance to go to Germany. So I called my wife, I said, hey, we can go to Europe or I can go to Fort, uh, Fort, uh, uh, Fort Lee, Virginia uh, for OCS or we can go to Europe. She said, well, let's go to Europe. So we did. Well, I, I went to a lot of schools and I, did a, did a lot of different stuff. So I made sergeant less than 13 months. So I, and I told the guy, I said, look, I'm just one of you guys. I got in trouble because it's the day I got my sergeant stripes, I gave my crew the rest of the day off. And they said, you can't do that. But I did. And I said, I'm going to tell you guys right now, I know we're in a war zone. I know this is terrible. But I'm never, ever going to ask you guys to do anything I wouldn't do, period. Well, we got out in the field, and we got bogged down in a rice paddy. We were stuck. We couldn't go forward. We couldn't go backward. It was all muck. And when we looked down, it was nothing but snake. I mean, it was like a giant ball of spaghetti, and they were all snakes in this brown gray mud you couldn't tell what they were and uh we had to get a choker we had to get a cable hooked up to pull us out well somebody had to get down there and i <laughs> and i said well we got to hook the cable up in my uh dale my gunner looked at me and he says remember what you said and i said I'm hooking the cable up, right? And they said, you're damn right you are. We ain't getting up. <laughs> snakes. So I had to go down in, and I think I did it in record time. I got down, hooked that cable up, and got back up. And uh, Lieutenant, was uh, he used his vehicle. He's up on the dike, and they're trying to pull us out. So we're going backwards, and he's going, and he's got turned around, so he's pulling and we're backing up and uh, the noise on those things is deafening and they're just cranking and the lieutenant's standing on the on the dike and when he was uh, we were going through this it was like the electric antenna on a Cadillac this thing came out of the dike and it's going straight up in the air he was like six two six three and the thing is up over his head and we're yelling at him trying to get their attention and finally the gunner who was also in the back on the machine gun saw what it was and shot it it was the biggest uh, uh, python or something it was a humongous and that must have been mama because all our babies was in that <laughs> i said that was that was quite a we laughed about that for a long time First platoon found a 90 millimeter rocket launcher and they mounted it on one of their scout tracks. Well, not to be outdone, <clears throat> we found a down Huey gunship 
took the uh, minigun off of it and had that on the side of one of the second platoon. Uh, and those things, uh, those miniguns were something. Well, then uh, the third platoon t uh, took a automatic grenade launcher, which was like the M79 grenades, and it was almost like a Gatling gun. You just cranked it, and it would run out about 300 a minute grenades out of the thing and had that mounted on one of their tracks. Well, when I left, when I had, they had one of the tracks, uh, the guys had stripped a uh, rocket launch off the side of a Huey gunship and was mounting it on the side of one of our our vehicles. Uh, and needless to say, in our area operations, there were several, uh, there, we were wanted. There were wanted posters for armored uh, from the uh, from the cav uh, station there. Uh, a regular guy was worth 500 and an officer 1500 if they could get us, but we were we weren't that easy to get. <laughs> had M48 M1 uh, tanks because they could handle the flechette the shotgun rounds, a 90 millimeter shotgun, that we had three of those in a platoon. We had one M113 that was modified. It had a 81 millimeter mortar. And then we had an infantry track, which was a 113, and it had an infantry squad. Then we had the rest were scouts, uh, there were eight calves. There were one one threes, two sixties, one in each back rear corner. Uh, the fifty caliber was the main gun, and uh, they were uh, uh, modified for jump for the warfare that we were involved in. Uh, so that was uh, we had three platoons: first, second, and third. And then uh, we had headquarters platoon that carried the support people and uh, our uh, troop commander. We're trying to get it fixed up to make it. And one of the things we had to do was go down and get it rearmed. So I went down and I picked up a 50 and I got two 60s. And we got, we already had our personal weapons from supply that wasn't a problem the armor that wasn't a problem and then we we're getting uh getting our uh, ordnance our uh, ammunition and such and we usually carry 13,500 rounds of m60 and 7,500 rounds of 50 caliber and then along with your uh your uh, m16 and uh personal weapons and I had an M79 grenade launcher and when we won in the ordinance uh, we're getting all this stuff uh, there were two cases of the uh, uh, M79 they call them like shotgun rounds okay and I told the guys on my crew I said take two cases and put on the track the armor stopped us and said you can't you can't have those. And so you can have the regular, you can have WP, white phosphorus, you can have the AG, high explosive, but you can't have those rounds. Uh, the uh, convention, uh, it's against the Geneva Convention. You're not allowed to use those. And so I didn't say anything. Well, later I said, look, because I am the demo guy, I went to demolition school in Germany. So they made me the automatic, which means I had to blow up dud art bombs or dud artillery rounds that we found when we were out on uh, doing our regular duties on patrol. If we found one, I was supposed to dispose of it. And I said, I need some C4, I need some blasting caps, and I need uh, some fuse. So he said, oh, okay, follow me. So he disappeared in this warehouse and stuff. And I looked back and I said, 
put those two cases of those on the, <laughs> on the track. And they said, well, he said you couldn't. I said, did you go to that convention? They said, no. I said, neither did I put two cases on the track. And that was my uh, personal one when I, we got off the track because they only went so far. And we did a lot of stuff on foot, the dangerous stuff. And uh, so that was my first shot. If we got ambushed when we were on foot, you know, get them to duck a, a 40 millimeter shotgun worked pretty nice. So anyway, that's, uh, I had that. And I had it loaded with HE and we were transporting some South Vietnamese, some Arvins, South Vietnamese regulars. And they're on the back and Tate, my driver, was a little erratic. And when he got mad, he just went crazy. And uh, we were going through this one field and for some reason he got upset and he just went crazy and he hit this thing and the whole thing flipped and my M79 fell. And when it fell, it went off. It's laying down there. And it was and this Vietnamese was laying on the ground on the on the floor of the of our A cab, the vehicle, and he's screaming, and he's holding his knee. And when I went over to check on him, I saw that round. It has to go so far before it activates itself to explode. It didn't go far enough. It just went far enough to hit him in the knee. <laughs> and when I rolled him over, the round was there, and I didn't want anybody to see it. Right now, they thought he just fell off and hit, hit his knee on the floor. I put it in my pocket until we... And then I disposed of it later. I threw it off the track. Uh, but he was hit with a, with a uh, M79 grenade and didn't know it. And we, was sent to uh, recover from his uh, from his knee injury. So uh, it, one thing after another. It was <laughs>